Hello, everyone. Welcome to this evening's virtual book club. I'm Robert Newman, President and Director of the National Humanities Center and your host for this evening's event. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that you'll need to log in to participate in the discussion. You can do that by clicking on the blue sign in button in the upper right hand corner of the page using your Gmail account. Tonight's conversation is the first in our series of virtual book club gatherings, which will explore conflict and resolution. Tonight and every Wednesday in February, we will be joined by distinguished scholarly guests to discuss how the humanities can help heal festering injustices and remediate the increasingly bitter rancor that marks our public discourse. Our guest this evening, Joy Connolly, is helping us launch the series by considering how thinking in the Roman Republic around issues of political conflict and class differences can speak to the challenges we face in the 21st century America. Joy Connolly earned her PhD in classical studies from the University of Pennsylvania in 1997, and she taught at the University of Washington and Stanford University before joining the faculty of New York University in 2004, where she served as director of the undergraduate core curriculum and then Dean of the Humanities. In 2016, she joined the Graduate Center of the City of New York as provost and senior vice president and in 2019, she assumed her current position as president of the American Council of Learned Societies, an organization with which the National Humanities Center has been pleased to work very closely. Joy is the author of two books and over 70 articles, book reviews and essays, and her writing has appeared in the New York Times Book Review, The Independent, The Village Voice, The Times Literary Supplement, the Chronicle of Higher Education, Book Forum, The Nation, and the Women's Review of Books, among others. She has served on the editorial board of the Journal for the History of Ideas and on the board of directors of the Society for Classical Studies, and currently serves as a trustee of the Middlesex School in Massachusetts and also a trustee of the National Humanities Center. And this evening, Dr. Connolly has graciously agreed to talk with us about her book, The Life of Roman Republicanism. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Joy Connolly. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for that generous introduction and uh, for having me in this book club. And uh, hello out there to all of you. I wish I could see you all in a big room um, or, uh, or maybe outside in a um, in, a, in a wonderful uh, area host, hosted by the National Humanities Center. But, uh, but I'm very grateful for the opportunity to talk to you via uh, 21st century technology, even under conditions of pandemic uh, and wintry chill, at least here in New York City. So thank you again, Robert. It's, it's great to see you, great to be here. Um, I'm gonna take a few minutes to talk uh, a bit about the genesis of this book, The Life of Roman Republicanism, and what I hope to, to achieve with it, and really what I see as distinctively of interest and of use of value to us now in the 21st century as we confront, in the context of the United States, which is my primary frame of reference, uh, real challenges of going on together uh, as democratic citizens. So the first question I think my own prior sentence has introduced is, if you're interested in thinking about how to go on together as citizens uh, or and as fellow residents, mit mention is the term I like to think of uh, the new German term. It, it comprises both citizens and residents of a, of a place. Um, if we're going to go on together, if, 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 if going on together is my interest, uh, then in, in the conditions of a late capitalist democracy, then why would I turn to thinkers in the in the first century Rome? For, for inspiration or for ideas. Uh, and, and, and this is a, something really worth thinking through because uh, there's, there's no question, and I wanna say this first you know, to acknowledge it and, and to have it forefront in our minds that uh, the Roman empire, the Republican Roman empire was uh, a militaristic extractive machine. Uh, it was a, a culture built on the oppression and conquest of 
um, of neighboring nations. The, the Roman Empire began as a small city-state city in the middle of Italy and, and within a, a few centuries, you know, had dominated uh, a span of, of territory that if you can keep this mental map in your minds, um, was as, as long across when you look from, um, from Britain to, uh, to the Eastern margins of the empire as the United States is uh, from coast to coast. It's in a gigantic region um, held together, you know, really under what uh, Greek orders in the second century CE who benefited from conditions of Roman peace and security and yet were had critical things to say about uh, the empire that, that created their world. Uh, was you know the conditions were living under the jackboot of of the Roman legions. So that the the the, the truly brutal conditions of life in in, in ancient Rome, uh, the casual tolerance of daily abuse and violence of slaves, um, of women, um, of non Romans. Uh, we, you might remember uh, those of you who know the letters of Saint Paul the and and the. Uh, and the Acts of the Apostles, how important it is when Paul at a certain point uh, when he's under threat um, of beating uh, in, in, a, in a Roman law court, he cries out, you know, I am a, I am a citizen. Uh, and this makes it impossible for him to be physically beaten. And it gives us a, uh, a, a glimpse of how close to physical violence um, every single day uh, residents of the Roman Empire who weren't citizens were. Um, so I'll say one one more final word as I build the case against reading these people at all, which is um, the and, and, and particularly important for, for issues of, of political uh, political thought and civic action now, and that's the Roman attitudes towards gender and the the um, the emphasis in, in Roman thought that we see in every genre of poetry and prose that we see in in art and and uh, in, in representations of all kinds. Um, the the all important dominance of of, of male virility and the uh, misogyny and and uh, and sexism that pervades Roman writing. So so with all of this, and I was constantly asked by students when I would teach this material, you know, why go to Rome? Well, one of the striking, most striking things about Roman writing, about uh, about politics, about the political, is an awareness of these the conditions and context under which uh, under which elite male uh, writers live and work, um, and and that was one that that sense of self awareness, which is very hard to put one's finger on, is one thing that drew me to try to dig into the authors that I that I study in this book. Uh, but I could get more specific than that to answer why Rome, um, and and this is by way of giving you an overview of the book uh, if you haven't read it. Uh, the the Roman. Empire, the Roman state, the Roman res publica, the public thing, which is what res publica means, literally, the, the thing public. Uh, the Roman Republic is at its essence a plural thing, a plural entity. And we know that the, um, the Roman coin, the, the motif on Roman coins, very popular through the, through the Republican period, um, is SPQR. You might know that, you might have seen that. Um, that imagery on any sword and sandals movie uh, in, in, featured or set in the Roman Empire. SPQR is, is itself dual, it's not singular. Senatus populusque Romanus, the Senate and the people of Rome. Um, so in, in, in the very self-presentation through this iconic SPQR on inscriptions, on, on their coins, as I've said, uh, the, there's a sense of duality and a sense too of plurality in what it is to live together as citizens. Uh, let me contrast this, and I know it's a it's a it's a glib contrast, but I, I think there's more to it than than uh, just my rhetorical transition to the the emphasis we see in Athenocentric and Greek thought based in Athens on the singular as the um, as the essence both of of politics of democratic politics. The Athenians speak their decrees. The Athenians, a single group. Uh, and we know in the fifth century BCE how increasingly the Athenians got um, got interested in policing their citizenship. You could only have citizenship by the end of the fifth century BCE in Athens if you had two Athenian parents, uh, and citizenship was very much seen as a um, as a matter of a binding of civic glue, uh, high standards to get in, um, and uh, and you know 
immigrants uh, and slaves, you know, didn't have a prayer. Quite the other, quite the opposite situation um, in, in the Roman state from the very beginning where immigrants um, had a path to citizenship, their children, grandchildren had paths into full civic responsibilities uh, and, and, and that sense of duality of, and plurality um, of, of the more than one, as I call it, is really ever present through Roman thinking about politics. So that's the first, the kind of the more than one. Uh, second, so the second reason I think it makes Roman, the Roman political thinking worth grappling with today is the intense interest Roman writers have in class and class antagonism. Uh, and this emerges, and maybe we'll get a chance to talk about this uh, a little later, very clearly in um, Cicero's De Republica, his dialogue on the Republic, where he, uh, he sees and he tells the story of Roman history, and, and one of his speakers tells the story of Roman history as it evolves from the founding of Rome, um, going all the way back uh, to its very beginnings as cyclical violence between the haves and have-nots. This is what drew, drew Machiavelli, uh, com, you know, compelled Machiavelli to, to grapple with Roman history and what generated Machiavelli's sense of what keeps a state dynamic is the struggle between the haves and have-nots. Um, I found this to sit when I really sat down and started thinking through the, the role of, of class antagonism, antagonism in Cicero, I found this to sit so in, in such interesting tension with the reputation Cicero has as a political thinker who is all about aristocratic elite dominance and control. Um, that's not a mischaracterization of Cicero. He is an elite of the, I mean, he, he, he is a, a thinker very much concerned with, uh, with the dominance of, of, of the propertied, uh, the propertied men among whom he lived his life. He had many negative things to say about the people. He had many negative things to say about um, the mob, as as we might translate his language, but the th that's true. But his concern and his interest in the constitutive nature of the political, as bound up in negotiating and navigating antagonism without resorting to violence, is key to uh, to the ways in which I think we need to conceptualize politics and and think about progress. So I, I could say a lot more about class and class antagonism, antagonism in Cicero, but, but let me turn to a, another thinker I try to grapple with in this group, um, in, of, uh, in the group of thinkers I, I take on in the book. Um, Cicero, uh, you all may know, is a, uh, is a Roman political thinker, but also a politician himself, rose through the ranks of Roman political offices and became consul, um, the, highest, uh, the highest Roman political office before he was uh, before he then maintained an active life in the Senate and finally uh, was assassinated at the order of Mark Antony in the course of, of Rome's civil wars. Less well known, um, but an equally fa very fascinating figure is a historian named Sallust, also deeply interested in class antagonism and in the, the interplay of rich and poor. And in a, a really understudied book in class studies, in my view, is his scintillating history. It's a fascinating tale of a war that had occurred about 50 years uh, earlier, just before the turn of the century, the second to the first century BCE, the war uh, with between the Romans uh, and uh, a, a North African king named Jugurtha. And in the context of this, um, this struggle, and this will maybe ring, ring familiar to those of us who are used to foreign wars being pitched as distractions to the Roman people while um, elected politicians would go about their nefarious business. Sallust shows us uh, speeches, he purports to record, I mean, although they're his own compositions, speeches by popular politicians uh, elected by uh, the Republican political assemblies that, that not only stir up class antagonism and then manage it very carefully, for, usually for the, for the, uh, to the advantage of these politicians, but that in the course of Sallust's short history, disclose, uh, again, what was surprising to me, a, a profound insight into the importance of recognition in civic action. So class antagonism for Sallust and, and the writing of class antagonism is a way to to talk about um, how important it is, regardless of one's wealth, 
or social status to be recognized as an individual, as a person, as a citizen. And that, that to me is tied together with Salist's uh, almost, I would say, modern insight into what it means to be a thinking person. And this starts getting really into the meat of my next point about Roman political thought and, and its interest now. For Sallust, you know, he, as he writes his history, as he tries to explain the importance of the events he's decided to try to, you know, to, to, to convey to his readers, his, his emphasis throughout is on sensory experience and the importance of, of sight, of taste, of smell, um, of, of you know, the, the clamor of the streets, um, the particular sound of a politician's voice. He tells you know, very dramatic tales uh, of, um, uh, of his individual actors in his history. And, and this to me is, and this is, this is my, my third point, is, is a way into taking seriously the ways in which Roman political, political thinkers think about the body. And it's our its significance to us as citizens because we experience life through and in our bodies. We make judgments, we make decisions, we see the world with the, the people, our, our mit mentioned, the people with whom we live um, as fellow bodies. Uh, so we're, we're so far here now, I hope it's clear from the world of you know, Platonic or even Aristotelian thought where the goal of political thinking is to define say justice or to think about what democracy is. Those are totally worthwhile questions. But for a Roman political thinker like Cicero, like Sallust, um, like Horace, a uh, poet I turn to later in the book, a uh, part of being a citizen, part of understanding how the world works and making good judgments about it is understanding that we're bodies and that we interact in intersubjectivity in intersubjective relations with one another on a bodily level. Um, so this, um, this is one of my simple concerns in, in thinking about Horace's satires, a bunch of poems that, um, that to my knowledge, you know, hadn't been taken that seriously as um, being about what it is to be a citizen or to be a judging person. Uh, but, um, but in that, in the chapter on, on Cicero, uh, excuse me, on Horace, I tried to delve into his use of dialogue and his uh, representation in these, these, uh, these long poems in, in the first book of satires of the, the constant scenes of encounter that happen in the Roman, in Roman streets, um, at parties, uh, among friends, you know, walking in the countryside, all the scenes that you know, resonate, I think, with all of us even now as microcosms in the citizen's life where uh, constant judgments about the other person and about oneself are going on. And they're happening at the bodily level. They're all about aesthetics. How is the other person, you know, how do they look? How are they evaluating me? Um, how, how do they walk? How do they spend money? How do they eat? Um, all of these, uh, this panoply of human actions is, is really the stuff of, the, of what we what we do when we judge one another and judge ourselves. And in Horace's satires, that judging eye is, is not just turned on the figures in the poems, um, interlocutors, it's also turned constantly on themselves. And this leads me to my next, um, my next uh, really focus of interest in, in all these, in Cicero and Sallust and Horace, uh, the, a thread that runs through Roman political thinking, the dangers of feeling oneself to be too much an autonomous individual. And that's a profound insight in, in Horace's satires that the, uh, the work of self-knowing and the work of judging that's integral to being a, a citizen of a republic, a place that's uh, I mean, uh, a state in which um, citizens hold popular sovereignty, that that cannot uh, that, that a person cannot make good judgments and defend those judgments as, the, as if he was an island. That we are, uh, our, our sense, our very sense of being and of agency emerges out of our interactions with other people. Um, and if we come to be too self-confident, too sure of ourselves, um, if we lose the habit of critical check, uh, then we're lost. And Horace is diagnosing a certain He's diagnosing a thread, uh, various threads in, in Roman society that he sees uh, as leading to that loss. So finally, and I should, uh, I should begin to, to close 
uh, to wrap up my, my, my overview of the book, um, I, I wanted to return at the end of the book to, uh, to try to pull these different threads together, from awareness of class antagonism, uh, the, the importance of recognition uh, in, the, in the citizen body, the importance of corporeal knowing, um, the, uh, the, the dangers of self-sovereignty. And I decided to turn to what I read as, frankly, I think is one of the most tragic texts in Roman literature. And that's um, a speech by Cicero um, in which um, Cicero address, it's actually several speeches by Cicero in which he addresses uh, the Senate in the context of its leadership under Julius Caesar. So this is late in um, the period that later generations would call the Roman Republic, period of the Roman Republic. And Cicero here in, in this series of speeches, and there are anticipations of this, um, of this habit of thought in his, earlier, in his earlier speeches. He was an active law court advocate as well as a, a political orator. Uh, what, what we see in play in these speeches is an awareness of the, uh, the constant state of division in the self that is the human condition in Cicero's view and that can never be negotiated away. You know, people are never, never singular. They're not simple. Um, and they're, even their efforts to dominate other people or to make their will you know, felt in the world um, are always complicated by their own self-doubt, by their hesitation, by their other commitments. Um, so I tried to tangle, uh, untangle this, this thread to, um, to begin to generate a more constructive picture of what a, a citizen, in my view, can and should be. Um, someone aware uh, of living in a body, someone aware always of one's context and one's class context, um, someone with, with deep inculcated habits of, of self-skepticism, um, not self-doubt, you know, but self-skepticism, self-criticism, and, and one who's always aware of, uh, of the many ways in which one could be in the world and the many impulses at work in the self. And yet, um, you know, we do make choices, we do take actions. Uh, how, do we, how we balance decisions and actions with the awareness of the different ways in which we could be. Uh, and a, not necessarily a respect, but an acknowledgement and a recognition of the many other ways of being in the world. Uh, this seemed to me to be uh, a productive way to be true to a thread of thinking I saw in Cicero's speeches, in Horace's satires, um, in this history by Sallust, and yet uh, useful for us to think about today. So let me let me um, let me close. Begin to close by uh, reading one piece here. There we go. Yeah, uh, this is a um, a quotation by Hannah Arendt, who's very much a guiding light of the book, uh, and. And she's quoting Carl Jaspers in the preface of the first edition of The Origins of Totalitarianism. She says, or she quotes, he wrote, to fall prey neither to the past nor to the future. What matters is to be entirely in the present. You could take out those last words and they could, you could read that uh, last line, second line as, what matters is to be entirely present in the present. Um, there's a sense of immediacy and uh, and liveliness in these Roman texts that uh, I've come to see um, as their invitation to us to inhabit a world where there are no simple answers, where the powers or the, the compulsions of greed, of dominance, of power over other people, where the sense of failure and finitude um, sense of guilt, uh, sense of divided self. These things are central to the human experience and these texts try to take them on in such an honest way. Uh, they're not about conceptualizing definitions or talking about the world as it might be. Wouldn't it be nice if, it, if, it, uh, if the world were uh, a list of civic virtues? And actually I am gonna read one more quotation. This one um, from Will Kimlicka where he says, 
and it really captures my sense of this, uh, of the dangers of political thought and what I think Roman thinkers protect, help protect us from. Kimlicka says, many studies of civic virtue may be reduced to a platitude, namely society would be better if the people in it were nicer and more thoughtful. This is one thing that Roman thinkers, uh, one fantasy that Roman thinkers don't let us fall into, that political thought and the job of political thought is to you know, list our virtues and simply put, put the ideas out there in the hope that it will all fall together. Um, they get us into the trenches. Um, they get us thinking about our emotions and our bodily sensations and our sense of self-division. So out of that um, comes, I think, interesting lessons about how we negotiate uh, the, the practices of civility and how we find, as, as I said at the very beginning, the right level of antagonism to maintain in our society, keeping it lively, keeping it fresh, keeping it honest, keeping it open to a plurality of voices, but without resorting or falling into violence. So I hope that's been a, a decent overview, Robert, and, uh, and given people a little taste of the book, and I'm happy to move to questions. Thank you very much, Joy. Um, I would like to remind our audience, please uh, post your questions and uh, I will field them. But uh, let me start, Joy, by asking you a question about the connection between uh, American history and the history of Roman Republicanism. Uh, my understanding is that the Romans did not have a constitution. And I wonder what James Madison, in going to his history books, uh, as he began to think about the American Constitution, and he did go deeply into the history books to think about why republics over the course of history had failed, uh, Rome amongst them, uh, Dutch Republic, et cetera. And he was trying to come up with uh, ultimately a system of checks and balances to, so that America, Americans' uh, republic would not fail. So what might Madison have learned from uh, Roman republicanism and its lack of a constitution? Oh, it's a great question. And I'll say two things. I think Madison um, and, the, and the rest of the founders, the founding generation saw in Roman texts a, um, I, I mentioned this briefly earlier, an understanding of their own, of, of the Romans' understanding of their own history as a constant cycle of making and remaking, of founding and refounding. This is something actually Hannah Arendt got very interested in when she was precisely thinking about the foundation of the um, of the American Republic um, in her um, in her work um, thinking about revolution. And so, so I think Madison and the founders looked at at this at uh, at Rome as and, and looked at its understanding you know by Roman writers as a dynamic cyclical thing and they saw great promise in that that rather than stick to uh, uh, founding principles that could entrammel them or become too much the property of one group of elites or uh, or another uh, that the Roman Republic was constantly on the make uh, now, this was obviously we ended up with a constitution in the United States, and and uh, and the founders deemed it, you know, deemed it better to to write down um, uh, their standards and, and and expectations, if that's an adequate way to describe the constitution. Uh, but but I think that they 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 worried a lot about um, how to manage dynamism in the emerging republic. Um, and I think that worry was in part shaped by their encounter with, with Roman texts. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll say is that um, when, uh, when American you know, revolutionary thinkers of that period look to Rome, they see, uh, they see also a history dominated by exempl moral exemplars and not by the letter of the law, so to speak. And they were profoundly inspired by that. And I think, um, although the founders themselves were you know, property own, owning white men, they were, uh, they were alive to the power of different kinds of moral examples and, and uh, they're and compelled, I think, by the power of narrative and, and, and moral narratives to create in people, you know, genuine love love of fellow citizens in a way that a, a written constitution or laws could never do. And 
you've referred to what I'm going to ask you next um, already, but I, I'd like you to elaborate a bit. So uh, in the contemporary imagination uh, with eight, the HBO series Rome or the film Gladiator, uh, we have a real focus on Roman ideas about citizenship and about virtue, which you're talking about, tied up, bound up with ideas about manliness. Um, and you, of course, are a feminist thinker. And how do you challenge that? How do you question that? How do you interrogate uh, uh, what we take away about the idea of civic virtue from the Roman Republicanism? Yeah, it's such because the the emphasis. I mean, virtus itself, virtue, is a word that rests on vir, the Roman word for for man. You know, where we get the word virile, virility, and so on. Um, it's it's just inextricable, and the historical connection, which Machiavelli and others make a lot of, between Roman civic virtue and and military action, um, is you know, that's a powerful thread. Um, it was. Know, an, a line of argument used to bar women from citizenship, you know, in, into the 20th century, um, that if one couldn't fight adequately as a soldier on behalf of the Republic, then one should have the right to vote. Um, so, so <laughs> it's an issue. For me, the, um, the, the compelling thread of women thinking that um, the number of feminist scholars, and far from the only one, you know, to, to, be, to be pulled into, uh, to thinking about this is their concern with the body and their interest in, in bodily experience, which in, in many other moments in, um, I'll just say European intellectual history, uh, I'll limit myself to that, uh, the, the, the binarism of associating the male or the masculine with the intellectual and the rational, whereas the sphere of the female is the bodily and the emotional and the passionate, um, that's a caricature of some mo of famous moments in, in Western or, or famous texts in, in, in Western European thought, um, but it's not wholly wrong. And Roman writing really troubles that distinction. Uh, to, be, uh, to be a good citizen, uh, and I talked a lot about this in my first book, is to be above all a good communicator. And you can't communicate well if you don't think about your body and think about how other people view it, um, think about your appearance, manage your appearance, uh, this leads in Roman rhetorical texts, which read to me very much like handbooks of citizenship, uh, to, a, to a preoccupation with bodily appearance and with aesthetics in general, that again, in many later moments in the European tradition of thinking about politics, get coded as feminine and set aside. So, uh, so I think that, um, that, uh, that thread, no, more than a thread, that uh, that powerful interest in the physical, the corporeal, the emotional, um, as essential to understand if we want to think about how and, and improve how we behave with one another and address one another as citizens, um, is is my answer to the to this really good question. So, one of our audience members uh, to pick up on 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 your your answer. Uh, asked the question, if the concept of the body was essential to the conception of citizenship, where does culture come in? Where does art and theater and literature and other aspects of culture come in uh, to this idea? Oh, that's a great question. In, 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 if I can start with a you know, risk, a slightly meta answer, um, another thing that drove or another element that drove me or pulled me to uh, to be a bit more of a Romanist than I am a Hellenist, although I do work on, on Greeks uh, writing and thinking in the Roman Empire uh, in, in the second and third centuries. But, um, but I've always been pulled um, into thinking about, uh, about Roman politics and Roman writing about politics because it crosses all genres. And, and, uh, and we, 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 we don't have a Roman Plato. Uh, we don't have a tradition of Roman political philosophy that sets it sets itself up as you know the queen discipline um, in in the way that uh, that Plato from the very first stagings of Socrates you know arguing with with the sophists uh, Plato is is very eager to do you know to define the um, the philosopher as uh, well the philosopher king I mean the person who pulls together the best capacity of, of reasoning with the best judge you know civic judgment for everyone else um, the uh, 
So in, 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 in the Roman context, we see a working through um, of, of political ideas in the epic tradition, um, in, the, uh, in the tradition of, of rhetorical handbooks or rhetorical treatises that I mentioned, in the writing of history, um, and in, uh, in, in philosoph and also in philosophical dialogues uh, and, and lyric poetry and, and, and various genres of hexameter poetry. And there, there's no, uh, how can I put it, kind of anointed genre of thinking uh, or writing in which political thought resides. It really runs through, uh, runs across the gamut of Roman uh, writing and practice of aesthetics, of, of aesthetics. So I'm going to stay with some of the questions from the audience. We have some excellent questions coming in. Um, uh, one of our audience members uh, is fascinated by your bringing up Hannah Arendt, uh, who was a student of Heidegger's, uh, this person mentions, and um, that you also use sort of Heidegger's phrases being in the world and asks, might the Roman thinkers have been inclined toward pre-Socratic pre thinkers uh, before the onset of metaphysics? Hey, and oh, here, here is where uh, the, the classicist's favorite cocktail hour uh, question of, you know, what texts would you most, most like to have comes into play? Because um, we, we don't have as much as we would like to have about uh, Roman thinkers' engagement with the pre-Socratic tradition. Um, there's certainly, uh, they're, they're just they kind of stick with the, the being in the world um, uh, question. There is a real difference, and I would say this questioner and others in the audience might be interested to compare um, a moment, so this isn't pre-Socratic, this is Socratic, it's a, I'm going to compare Cicero to a platonic dialogue, but um, there's a moment in uh, Plato's Phaedrus where Plato and, uh, and uh, excuse me, where Socrates and his friend, Phaedrus, young friend Phaedrus go for a walk and they reach a beautiful stream, they, they leave the, the city of Athens, they go out into, in the countryside, they reach a beautiful stream and they find a beautiful plane tree and it's hot and they decide to sit underneath it. And it becomes the scene of a very famous philosophical dialogue about the nature of love. In, in Cicero, um, and it's, it's fascinating that, that love was the, the theme of the Phaedrus, so bear that in mind as I finish the comparison. In Cicero, uh, in, in his really magisterial three book dialogue called De Oratora on the Orator, which is a text about, it's really his I think central, Cicero's central text of political thought. It's his working through of what a good speaker is, a good communicator, as I said, the essence of, of Roman citizenship, in my view, um, in my view of Cicero, I should say. And, and similarly, his speakers, in this case, Roman senators and their friends, all engaged in Roman public life, they too go out into a meadow or into a, an outdoor space, space, I should say, but it's on the grounds of a villa and it's, um, and they, they find a plane tree, they sit beneath it, but they call for cushions to be brought and they sit on cushions and they, they, um, they interact in and, and speak at, in, in, in a lot of detail about events in the world. Um, as it is, so every word I think in this passage is carefully chosen. Cicero know, knows very well that his readers will think instantly of, of Socrates sitting under his plane tree, you know, in bare feet outside Athens, you know, no, no cushions to be found, no houses to be found. Um, it's, it's all nature. So this bears on the pre prior question too, perhaps uh, about culture. Cicero's speakers are, are, they're not out in nature, out in the wild, thinking about gods and, and myths as Socrates does at the beginning of the Phaedrus. They are sitting in a cultivated space, enjoying fresh air, but absolutely in, and, and uh, they can't take themselves out of the world of politics that they inhabit. And they talk about this and, and even laugh a little bit about it. I hope that's answered the question. Oh, great. So Let's pick up on oratory a, a bit more. And your, your first book was about oratory. And this book returns several times to public speech and particularly with Cicero's or, uh, orations. So why, why the fascination with public speech uh, in your work? And 
talk to us a bit about the distinctions between an orator and a demagogue. Oh, a, a great and a very difficult question. Um, in, and, and I think this cuts to the heart of your, uh, your choice of theme uh, and, and civility and, and what to make of that world, uh, that, that, that term civility. Uh, the, you know, for Cicero, um, the, the, and, and I'll stick with him for a moment, the, the importance of communication, uh, of, of, of good communication, of being a responsible political, you know, elected political representative slash leader. Um, and I don't mean to imply that, that Roman elections were conceived as electing representatives in our sense, but so I should withdraw that word, I'll just say, it gets us into, into, into deep waters. But I will say that Cicero sees the role of the elected politician and of the lawyer in the law court who's in public space as very much reflecting um, ideally the best of what people can be and the best of how they can speak, how they can hear and listen to other people, how they can reason, how they can reason with emotion, you know, understood as part of the, judge, of the process of judgment. And the difference between, I mean, that, that really is the difference between an orator and a demagogue who loses sight of the plurality, loses sight of the, of the multitude, begins to treat the multitude as an other and, as, and thinking of himself and his own interests as, um, as, the, as the dominant force, as beyond criticism, as even beyond the capacity of his own self-reflection. Um, there's a fascinating, very tiny moment in the treatise on the order in the first book where uh, Cicero's speakers share a moment. They're, they're both experienced politicians and they share a moment that the younger men in the dialogue, uh, in the conversation, I should say, are really amazed by. And, it's a, and, and what they're sharing are moments when they became afraid. They had stage fright. Um, and, and it's very telling, and I think <laughs> absolutely carefully placed near the beginning of this book that, that Cicero says, and his, his main figure Crassus says, part of being a truly good speaker and a and good man, is that's I mean, the connection is, is either implicit or explicit through the whole treatise. Part of being a good speaker, Crassus says, is in a way being able to be afraid because you never forget that the audience is there and that they may go any way, they're unpredictable. And one's sensitivity to that unpredictability and the need to be responsive to the audience and to manage its passions, to manage one's own passions, that um, it's complicated and it's a process. So it's not, it can't be captured in, in simple, you know, in single words or simple descriptions but becoming practiced in that process uh, and never losing sight of the dialogic and really um, multi-logic, multivalent relationship between audience and speaker. That's what a demagogue never does. The demagogue is, yeah. So in, in President uh, Biden's inauguration, um, I guess most of the attention or a lot of the attention uh, uh, in that inaugural event and subsequently was about the young woman poet um, and her poem about, uh, uh, which, which was a, a, a large commentary on our present moment and, and what we need to do about it. And this book very much talks about Horace and the idea of poetry of, as political action and the uh, importance of, of aesthetics uh, in political action. Um, but if we go back to the Greeks, of course, we have this notion or the mythology that Plato wanted to get rid of the poets uh, as part of the Republic. So what's up with that? If, uh, if, if we were to make poetry more central to our politics, would we have a better politics? And what do we learn from the Romans about that in terms of application? Oh, Robert, that's such a good question. And it's so, it, and it's a challenging one, isn't it? And I know you've, you've thought about this too, because it's so easy to fall into, as, as Will Kimlicka says, you know, platitudes about how beautiful poetry is and how it opens us into experiences of beauty. And oh, all these things are true, but, you know, then there's a real step between that and what you were 
you know, what, your question, right? Um, so I think I have two answers to that. And one is, um, and, and in a way that this comes out of what I say at the end of the book, when I talk about, I look back um, and, and comment on my own practice and what I hope is a self-critical and, 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 and humble way. Uh, and, and I say there, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time walking the reader you know, or walking, I hope, with the reader through close readings of difficult texts and particularly in long chapter on Horace. And that, but, but I hope, I said in the book, I hope that it's clear that this very process of close reading and engaging with complex words is, is a valuable intellectual, emotional, psychological process. It, it is itself a mode of self-reflection. Now, this isn't to say, I mean, a productive self-reflection. And this isn't to say, and, and we can all talk about, if we have Hannah Arendt on our minds, um, you know, we could, we could invoke, you know, Eichmann and his fellow Nazis who loved, you know, listening, loved Goethe and loved listening to, to Beethoven. I mean, this is the classic rejoinder to that. Um, so I would say, in, in my second, my second thought is, is to, and this, this is really the value of, of poetry, uh, listen to in a group, which is, I think, what touched so many people about that performance was that it's so rare for us to hear poetry and the spoken word in a, you know, in an audience and, and performed in the way that she did it so wonderfully. But that collective experience of, um, of poetry, and I would say of, of art in a museum or a gallery um, or in the park, um, or um, even of, of a film, I mean, or of music of all kinds, that the collective aesthetic experience uh, can go in many different directions. It's not controlled, it's not controllable, but it provides um, what, I, what Hannah Arendt, drawing the Kant, in fact, would say is a kind of microcosm lesson in how to talk to others who are not ourselves uh, about values uh, and about the experience of something other than our, you know, something uh, uh, that has no immediate use for us, but that calls on us nonetheless. So uh, I'm thinking of, of Hannah Arendt's famous um, reworking of, of, of Kant's third critique when she remembers, you know, Kant says, this is the, the thing about art, you know, that we each have our subjective judgments of an artwork or a poem. And we know rationally that other people will have other reactions, but we somehow deeply, on some deep level, expect that people were in contact with our friends, you know, other art viewers or art listeners or readers, that they're gonna have the same reaction we do of good, bad, beautiful, ugly, but they don't. And so as Hannah Arendt reads that, um, that passage, she suggests that there's a profound political lesson to be learned in, the, in thinking about the experience of art as a, almost a, and this is not what she says, this is me, but almost as though it's a practice for getting used to that sense of, wait, this is a fellow citizen. This is a, this is a, you know, this is a person with whom I share the world, my city, my, my block. We should feel the same way about, you know, who to vote for, or how, how to spend our tax dollars, but we don't. So we, we don't have many moments in which to practice for those discussions, uh, but artwork, uh, of, of various kinds, including poetry, is one. Let me go back to some of the audience questions. Um, one of our audience members wants us to go back to the public good idea, and, and uh, he found the concept of citizens' interdependence on one another for senses of selfhood quite arresting, and wonders if you can discuss how this concept appeared in the Roman Republic and how it might serve us today. Oh, that's, I'm glad, I'm glad the questioner does find it arresting and I certainly continue to do so. Um, I've come to think of this in Roman life, in, Roman, in the context of Roman culture as almost an overcompensation because as I said at the beginning, uh, the kinds of Romans who would write books, you know, the voices that we, that we hear, that we're able to hear now, um, lived in a world where they, by dint of their wealth and position, most of them, not all, uh, but most of them were in a position to exert, to, to dominate others and, and to, um, to behave in all ways as though their will was all that mattered in the world. 
So whether, you know, I don't really want to get into psychologizing uh, these authors uh, in, in, in any baseless way, but um, whether it's a overcompensation or a hypersensitivity to it, you know, interrelations between people and the possibility of violence and domination in them, um, there is certainly, and, and, and I really chose the authors I did for this book, partly because they shared an interest in this, in intersubjectivity. Uh, but it, it runs really through through Roman writing that the the, the notion that uh, one can't be a good person without the presence of other people. This is something actually Cicero says pretty explicitly that you know essentially uh, if you're on an if you're a person behaving well on an island, you may be behaving well, but that's not action in the world. And action in the world with other people is really what matters. Uh, there's a, a yeah, there's there's a lot more I could say about this. The um, but I'll I'll just invoke maybe a um, I'll take a take a literary turn for a second. Another another issue I've thought about a lot in in terms of uh, the importance of the suspension of self and the awareness of the need for full living, the need for interaction and uh, interreliance uh, on reliance on others. Uh, I've also wondered whether this arises in part from the Roman awareness of coming second after the Greeks, which is a relationship that they styled in exactly those terms. So this isn't a modern construct. This is very much the way Roman writers beginning in the third century begin to talk about Roman literature that, uh, and I'm talking about the third century BCE, that Roman writing is the inheritor or the successor or the child or the descendant, and they use all kinds of metaphors of writings, mostly in Athens, but also in Alexandria, but writings from the, the, the East, East Mediterranean writings in, and, and Southern Italy writings uh, all in Greek. So there's much to say about that relationship, but there is a sense in which um, core texts, Roman texts, um, like the that the Romans themselves defined as core, you know, to uh, like Virgil's Aeneid, are all about relationality. They're all about the dependence on earlier Greek models and the relationship or oscillation of meaning between a, a Greek model or a Greek original and a and a Roman product. So that might be another way for for people here to to think about um, about literary traditions and the kinds of ethical habits of thought that they instill or encourage. So another questioner asks, what about uh, what about what comes after the Republic, namely the the Empire? How might uh, an imperial text such as Virgil's Aeneid be commenting on some of the issues you're interested in in Cicero or Sallust? And uh, she mentions that she's asking this question because some might say that the Roman Empire is a more relevant comparison to today than the Republic. <laughs> It's a, I, I know it's tempting to go there, isn't it? Um, when we think about the narratives of, of decadence and consumerism and, uh, and, and also, you know, security on a, on a, uh, a scope, you know, the world had not known it before um, for all the oppression and violence that was involved in maintaining that. Um, so there, there are interesting parallels. I still think though that, um, and I'll go back to the SPQR, um, that that sense of duality and, and plurality that that is um, that's so important to Roman Republican pre-imperial pre-autocracy uh, Roman notions of of, of Rome uh, that continues to, to really pull me in because the the by contrast to you know the world where autocracy was dominant and negotiating with the power of one you know really became the the, um, the desideratum of the 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 issue in, in the Roman Republican context uh, the the awareness of uh, for for an, for an elite uh, again the writers I'm dealing with largely live in that world the awareness of the possibility of overreach the attraction of dominance the attraction of greed of you know military general appointments that would last you know, untold years, uh, the appeal of, of exploiting, of, of, of extraction. Uh, these, and this is really where the, the Roman preoccupation with civic virtue that so attracted the, the founding generation you mentioned a few minutes ago uh, arises from. And, and those, uh, 
those, those attractions, those appeals, those problems are so much with us now. I think the way they get translated in the autocratic context of you know, negotiating the power of the one of the emperor uh, really doesn't have the same appeal. So, or, it, or the same relevance I think for us now. So another question is about um, uh, bodily awareness, self-critique, recognition of the self as, as a part of a greater whole. All seem to imply the questioner says a kind of humility. And uh, the questioner asks, is it fair to characterize of Roman thinking in that way, in terms of implying the kind of humility. It's a that's a complicated one, especially when thinking about Cicero, who is who really in his personal letters comes off as far from humble. So, um, so granted that we're not just talking about individual characters here, but but styles and uh, and an ethos uh, aimed aim for in writing. I think humility is one way to put it. I I, I would probably recast that. As, um, as a self-awareness that I mean, part and parcel of which is an awareness of contingency and, and unpredictability and also of incapacity. Um, so, you know, even a Cicero, when he's making a speech on behalf of a, um, of a defendant will say, and I think it really is more than just a rhetorical tick or a habit, um, he'll say, you know, to the best of my ability, um, and he'll and there there are doors opened up in our in, in the text to acknowledging where one might fall short and where one might think one's doing a wonderful job, and then the situations that the the external circumstances unexpectedly change. So, so I I think I would I would back away a little nervously from the word humility uh, as applied to some of these uh, these figures and and in particular Cicero and Horace. Is, for us, so ironic, you know, from a, a different problem, um, and and think more about self awareness tempered by the awareness of the unpredictable world around oneself. Uh, we just had a question uh, asking, what do you make of the white supremacist groups adopting SPQR as a banner or slogan? Oh, this is a an issue my my field um, is is reckoning with and, and paying a great deal of attention to. There's a wonderful piece in the New York Times Magazine that went uh, public online, I think just yet today or yesterday, um, about a wonderful, uh, brilliant classicist at at Princeton who's um, from the Dominican Republic originally. Um, he's black and is is one of uh, a number of young scholars of color and and supporters. Who are making this really their part of their their project? Um, not that they should have to bear the burden of this alone. And there are lots of white older scholars and scholars of all types who are putting their shoulder to the wheel in making it clear that we're taking as our responsibility and, and really putting it center forward in pronouncements from the profession. Um, the current president of the Society for Classical Studies, I'm, I'm proud to say, Shelley Haley is is a black woman. Um, we are making it very much our business to understand, I would say, the need that this kind of appropriation uh, seeks to fill and to make it clear that we understand and we continue to work on it to understand better the formation, the history of the formation of our field and the ways in which there's no question it's been embedded in, um, in, structure, in structures of, of racism uh, in arguments excluding blacks from school, um, in arguments against allowing women to study Latin and Greek. I mean, there's any number of ways in which uh, classical texts have been deployed in hateful and, and damaging ways. Um, that's not all the, the texts are, are about though. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. And our answer, as I hope the answer for all scholars would be is, is in more knowledge and in effective communication of our knowledge to a broader public that that uh, they don't own they don't own us and own our texts and in fact are deforming uh, some of the central values by which we as scholars live. Great. So let me ask you one concluding question. Uh, you and I in our respective roles as, as leaders of our respective organizations are are continually making the case for the humanities. So I want to, to ask you, how has 
let's take, take one of your figures. That's how has Cicero helped you make that case on a kind of daily, weekly basis? <laughs> the, I, I'm thinking still of, of the humility problem with him. Um, but um, but even Cicero has a strong self-awareness and, and self-irony. Um, I think, um, so my answer really falls in a couple of, of stages in my life. I think when I was young, like, like you know, uh, perhaps not uncommon for, for scholars in their, in their teens and 20s, uh, I had a very serious approach to life. And I think in, in, that, in that period of my life, uh, text, including the speeches and letters of Cicero, including Virgil, um, including Euripides, um, and many others outside the Greek and Roman tradition, even though I didn't fully appreciate it at the time, gave me uh, a, an, an appreciation of the comic and an appreciation of irony and, um, and a, bit of <laughs> a bit of a reminder of, you know, that, that cut me down to size, a reminder that, um, that the, really the height, I think this is very Ciceronian actually, that the height of being an effective communicator is an awareness that if you come off as the person in the room who thinks they're the best communicator, you're gonna fail. And so, so there's a kind of built-in, again, ironic sensibility uh, into these texts. So that helped me. And I think that that's exemplary really of the kinds of, uh, the kinds of self-understanding on the individual level that close engagement with texts and, and, and close engagement with humanistic knowledge can impart. And the, and the second part of the answer in, in shorter is uh, that I have seen uh, in you know, my various posts and various roles uh, just how astonishingly diverse humans' interests are. Um, so for everyone who says to me, you know, how can you spend your life studying and teaching texts that are 2,000 years old? I say, but, you know, take one minute on the internet and you'll find a vast array of interests ranging, you know, from the banal to the bizarre. And the, the thing about teaching goes back to my interest in, in the Roman sensitivity to unpredictability. As teachers, right, we never know what is going to work with students. And so keeping alive the vast array of human cultural endeavor and you know, writing, art, music, poetry, history, philosophy, all the things the humanities and related social sciences encompass um, seems incumbent upon us because if we narrow our focus, we're gonna lose people. You know, we're gonna make it more likely that another individual will not find their Cicero, uh, will not find their Virgil. Um, whatever that person, Cicero or Virgil is. So it's, a, it's an argument, I guess, especially as we see through the internet, more and more of the vast diversity of human interests, you know, they're really at our fingertips. It seems to me to make it incumbent upon all of us to preserve, uh, to preserve that range of interest, to study it, to make it available to others. And, uh, and it's a kind of celebration. I really think of it as an act of love. Thank you, Dr. Joy Connolly, and thanks to everyone who participated in tonight's conversation. I also want to thank the sponsors of our virtual book club series, Duke University, the Federation of State Humanities Councils, the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, the Research Triangle Park Foundation, the Furman Humanities Center, and Osher Lifelong Learning Institutes at Arizona State University, Duke, Furman, North Carolina State University, and the University of Michigan, as well as listeners like you. This evening's event has been recorded and will be available here on the National Humanities Center YouTube channel. Please click the subscribe button and the notify bell below this video to be notified of future discussions and other videos from the center. You may also visit nationalhumanitycenter.org to learn more about the center's work and other opportunities to explore the humanities. Please join us uh, each Wednesday during February at this time at 7 p.m. Eastern time for other discussions in the series in terms of conflict and resolution. Good, e good evening to everyone and please stay well and stay safe. Thank you.